this display is a very interesting, uh, has a very interesting history. Um, I actually taught a class with Michelle Oshiro, who's uh, my co-playwright. And uh, this was a class that was taught to incoming humanities scholars at uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore Co County, where I am. And um, it was on math and the humanities. And this is something that she approached me and I said, okay, let's do it. And uh, we had a, you know, we, I mean, she's an English professor. She's also the dramaturg at the Folger Theater. Uh, and uh, we went through it. There were a lot of places that we came at it from completely different angles. It was truly a clash in some cases, but it was also very edifying. Uh, the students didn't always think that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but it was you know it was a very interesting class and it was about poetry and math and literature and math and all sorts of other things which we were looking at the intersection of these different things, and then um, some time later we were asked uh, we we actually wrote a series of articles on this in the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, after that, someone saw these and uh, Saint Jerome University they asked us to actually come there and give a talk on it and. Uh, I said to myself, wait a minute, she's a dramaturg, she has all this theater experience, why don't we write a play on it? And so that's what we did, except we didn't tell them till about two weeks before, because we didn't know if we could do it, if we could actually write a play. And we went there, uh, we told them two weeks before, could, could you give us some actors to actually um, you know, help us with this play? So they actually found some actors, we did it, we met these people, like the day of the play, we read it and we had a reading, and it went well. And then we uh, teamed up with uh, Alan Kreisenbeck, who's sitting right here, uh, who, who, who's in the drama, the drama department at UMBC. And he, he acted as our director. And so we took it to a different level. And uh, we started, uh, we, we actually had two performances last fall. And we've performed, we've, by performances, I mean stage reading. So we've done a few other ones as well. And so today, uh, what we're doing is we're doing one scene and this is the scene on Shakespeare and math. And uh, Florence gave us a perfect uh, lead in mm -hmm. because this is about King Lear. So you mentioned King Lear, it's about King Lear. And there's actually something about squaring the circle too in a slightly different way. Uh, Euclidean math and all, almost all the topics you covered are in the whole play, but you won't get to see them. Um, so let me just say that in this play, uh, the setup is that these two professors, Kessler is the English professor, Pearson is the mathematician, and uh, people always ask us, well, how true is this? And it isn't. I mean, we took little bits of you know, the tensions we saw and were under the surface, and we kind of amped them up for dramatic effect. Uh, so what you're going to see is scene seven. Uh, these two professors have been forced by their university to actually teach this class together. So this university wants to promote interdisciplinarity. So that's why you know, they're doing <coughs> this. And so it's a riff on that as well. And uh, they've had several sessions, and they've argued about the syllabus. And uh, in the scene that we're going to do, uh, they've, they've actually uh, <laughs> Pearson, I mean, these, these students are actually humanities students, so they aren't quite on the same wavelength as him. And so you might find him in this scene to be a little, uh, it's not his scene, it's the Shakespeare scene. So he's a little um, you know, aggressive, or he, he has some issues with that. Um, so the people who are going to actually uh, enact this with us are uh, Karen Rothenberg, who's uh, right here, Gregory Mack, and uh, Heather Luna Sp Spence. So uh, I guess we'll just start it. On. So everyone, I guess, well, our mics are all on. My mic on, yes. I bet some of you were surprised to see King Lear on our syllabus. I figured it was Shakespeare's version of the mad mathematician. What it was, was blackmail, pure and simple. She said she'd only let me include the movie Pie if she could put in Lear. Not so much, Bert. Think about it. Max and the other mad mathematicians know too much. Lear knows too little. At least at the start he does. How many of you were already familiar with the tragedy of King Lear? You want a tragedy? 
making a mathematician read Shakespeare. That's the tragedy. <laughs> Took the Dan play all the way to Iceland for a conference and couldn't bring myself to crack it open. I want to consider how the play's tragedy is due, in some part, in the mathematical ideas circulating in that text. OK, I'll admit it. The play was good when I finally got to it. But what a stretch to tie it to math. Think about it. The play begins with flawed arithmetic, a problem of division. Ooh, division. Could she have found anything more trivial? But hey, I'm cooperating. Lear begins by dividing his kingdom among three daughters. But he does not do this equally. That ain't right. Now, Cordelia, he says to the favorite, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters? And Cordelia says, Ha! Trick question. Nothing. She says nothing. And Lear doesn't like that. He cautions her with his well-known response. Nothing, nothing will come from nothing. nothing. Good. Ultimately, the play will have to prove or disprove this statement. Does nothing come from nothing? Well, it's only when Lear has nothing that he realizes his mistakes. He has to lose his daughter, his kingdom, his men, his mind, before he gets that he was this complete egomaniac as a dad and king. But he learns it too late to do anything about it. So what's the point? Especially if we don't get to anything mathematically interesting. <laughs> there is a point, though. That speech at the end, wait, I marked it. When Lear and Cordelia are captured, and he tells her, here, we'll live and pray and, and tell old tales and laugh at gilded butterflies. That's not nothing. It's beautiful, transcendent. I get it. He's going to teach her about irrational numbers. Good one, Bert. And taking your cue, let's focus our discussion back to math by actually trying to- Transcendent. I like your description, Sandra. Lear indicates that they will be free, even in prison, because of their bond. He asks Cordelia's forgiveness. And this is really important because- I think Lear learns nothing. Yeah, like I said. By which I mean the number zero. This was the beginning of the 17th century, and the Arabic numerals had just come into common usage in Europe over the last 100 years. Zero was a new concept, just and- so, I was getting to that. As I indicated to Professor Pearson, the word nothing occurs 29 times in the play. Much ado about nothing. The fool calls Lear a O without a figure as we see that new mathematical understanding of zero in action. The remarkable thing is that zero by itself is nothing. But it to the right of the number one, and you get 10, another zero makes 100, another 1,000, endless possibilities. Easy enough for us, but a new concept to Shakespeare's world. So maybe. Like when the evil daughters keep taking away Lear's men, they're sort of cutting off the zeros he needs to feel like a king? Very like. Huh. I didn't realize zero had so much oomph. Oh, but zero can do much deeper stuff. You can build all the numbers from zero, or rather from the empty set. The empty? Uh, just think of a collection of objects that don't exist. For instance, the set of all mad kings in this classroom. Now here's the mathematical trick. Identify this empty set with a number zero. Mathematical. And, and then consider the set containing this empty set. This is no longer empty, is it? Because it contains something. It contains the number zero you've just constructed. I think I get it. I kind of do. So you call this the number one. And then you create a set containing the numbers 0 and 1 and call it 2, and so on. It's a chain reaction. You end up with all the counting numbers. So everything comes from nothing? Hold on. I don't see any set theory in the play. I still say Lear had it right. Nothing comes from nothing, because like everyone's dead at the end. They're nothing, literally. 
They are the empty set. Except Shakespeare told us that nothing is a mark of being solitary, isolated, that O oh, without a figure, and Lear is not alone at the end of the play. He and Cordelia have reunited. They are each other's O's and figures, so to speak. Not sure what you're trying to say. Think of I, the individual, as the number one. An individual's value shifts depending upon each zero or figure we put next to it. So the cast of Lear, like all knowledge, right, can be represented by a string of zeros and ones. The binary system, yes, where two digits, zero and one, represent anything. But let me stop Professor Kessler before she crowns Shakespeare, the original computer scientist. Oh, you can be so funny, Professor Ke Pearson. What I'm saying is that it's not just new ideas about zero woven into the fabric of the play, but also new ideas about one, the individual, the I. Have you heard the term Renaissance self-fashion? No, but I can't wait to impress my colleagues in the math lounge by banding it about there. Now take Edmund. Now, God, stand up for bastards. He refuses to be a zero. I think you're carrying this one and zero business a bit too far. Oh, oh, and the evil sisters, could they be like Edmund's zeros? He doesn't care which one he ends up with as long as he marries someone who can make him the number one guy. Enough already with these the zeros. The point that... is we see characters, one after another, caught up in the calculation of human worth. Especially Cordelia, when Lear calls her nothing, but the king of France says, no, she is herself a dowry. Or, at the beginning, when she says, I love your majesty according to my bond, not more nor less. Well, in that case, why don't we just pronounce Cordelia to be the mathematician of the play? The heroine, a mathematician. Now, why didn't I think of that? And declare the duality in King Lear to be how math about, versus the how, humanities. How about we not reduce Shakespeare's greatest tragedy to a duality? I mean, if you want to read insupportable meanings into everything. Excuse me. There is a world of right in terms of literary readings, but you most certainly do need to support your theories with closed textual. Textual, yes. Have a ball with your textual theories. Just leave numbers out of it, will you? This pro as zero and one as hero, it's fantastic. No more fantastic than your empty set? Didn't you tell me there were logical difficulties in defining it? Something we both agreed would be too complicated to bring up in front of a class. We classic. also agreed to find a common ground. It's hardly my custom to pick up Shakespeare and say, gee, how can I make this about math? The whole idea is to find resonance as interesting analogies. What exactly are you contributing today? Nothing. She wants you to say nothing. Enough, Burton. I'm trying to protect the integrity of math from the distortion of analogies. But I see I've been accused of shirking my duty. Well, here's the perfect assignment to go with this play. Oh. Suppose we represent King Lear's kingdom as this wedge, and suppose he decides to divide it equally amongst his three sisters, amongst his three daughters. Can you show him how to trisect it? using only straight edge and compass? Are, are we allowed to use a pencil? Yes, Burton. Really, is that even a question? <laughs> you just can't use a protractor or anything fancy. Turn in your solutions on Monday. What I didn't tell them, of course, is that mathematicians have proven that this task is impossible. <laughs> Thank you.